Good morning, everyone, or I guess officially good afternoon. Uh, thanks a lot for, for being here. I'm going to tell the story a little bit of the three different sets of APIs at Intuit. I'm going to focus on one, but there's really three different going on. So I'm going to set a little context first. Uh, she mentioned I'm the CIO for the company. I've been there for about 12 years. I've been the CIO for a little less than a year, but I've been running kind of the enterprise systems for about the last year and a half. And when I came in about two years ago, uh, the IT department, for those of you who are in IT, this will be familiar, was in the middle of a major overhaul of everything. Uh, the CRM systems, the order system, everything we were doing. It was codenamed 10.1 because this was supposed to be the first release of this project uh, in 2010. Well, of course, this was September of 2011, uh, and there was still no end in sight to the project. Uh, any of you who have done big brand upgrades, you know how these go. Uh, and um, my job was to land that project. And, and my background is I'm an, I'm an engineering guy, uh, CS guy. I'm not an IT guy. And so I really had to learn a lot about IT projects and enterprise projects while I was also trying to land this project. And the strategy for the company at the time for enterprise products was we were an all Oracle shop. And the reason was we thought going with Oracle would give us the best end-to-end -end experience, uh, the best user experience, and also really one partner who would be accountable for us with the outcomes, uh, which are all great things uh, and, and great ideas. Uh, and we were hosting all of these applications in our data centers where we were also hosting our, our products. Uh, and for those of you who don't know Intuit, by the way, I guess maybe I should say that, uh, we're the makers of TurboTax, QuickBooks, Quicken. Uh, you may know of our products more than you know of us as a company. We're about four and a half billion dollars in revenue. Uh, and we've been going through a transition, we're almost a 30 year old company, of being a box software company to being an online company. So when I say hosted in our data centers, we were also emerging as our strategy as running data centers, figuring out what the standards were for those data centers, while also trying to put our offerings there and put our enterprise applications there, you can imagine some tension between how you would run a data center for your enterprise apps and for your offerings. So that was kind of the context. And here was kind of the realization. As we landed that project, which we successfully did uh, in May of last year, we did do the upgrade. We got about half of the company on, on that version. And we stepped back and said, is this really the right thing? Uh, I was new to the group. Uh, the CIO at the time was also uh, new to the group. And we stepped back and looked at the strategy. And we had a couple of realizations. One, in the upper left, that actually isn't a picture of me, although it kind of looks like me in the boat. Uh, that's, what we were, that's what we realized we were in. We were in this really nice canoe that had these great concierges who were rowing us around, the Oracle folks. And they were wonderful at treating us well. They really jumped in and helped us succeed. Oracle really was a great partner. But it was a canoe. Uh, it really wasn't a speedboat. It wasn't state of the art. Uh, and it really required that kind of handholding to make it work. The other in the upper right is, in order to do anything, it required rooms full of people to make decisions. Uh, because of the way we had integrated the system and because of the way we were working with partners, in order to make any change in the Siebel interface or the order processing or how we were setting up items, it just took rooms full of people to get those things done, which takes time. On the left lower bottom, the whole Oracle stack end to end, while with the, the integration packs and AIA and those of you know Oracle technologies, it all sounds great. It's all been through a bunch of acquisitions and they really haven't invested what they need to to put that together as a, set, as a whole end to end system. So we ended up writing lots of custom code to make it work. Uh, and then it's, so therefore it ended up like a Rube Goldberg machine. And we have tons of issues where we're having orders getting stuck. We don't quite understand where. And again, Oracle is great. They parachute these guys in. They help us figure it out. But that's no way to run a business reliably. And then on the right-hand side, net promoter score is something we use as a company to judge all of our offerings and how we're doing. And we started using that as an internal score as well. We now do a net promoter survey for our internal customers twice a year. And we basically ask them the one key question. If you don't know Net Promoter, there really is, uh, Fred Reicheld is the guy behind it. There's really one key question you ask any customer. Would you recommend this service to a friend or a colleague? And what you do is you take everybody who's zero to six and you count them as detractors. Everybody who's nine and 10 is promoters and you take promoters minus the detractors and that's your Net Promoter score. And we were at minus 50 uh, with our sales and care agents after we did this big upgrade. And what we realized is we could incrementalize ourselves to maybe a minus 30, but we were never going to get to where we wanted to be. And best in class on a net promoter score, you know, Zappos and Apple and others, is 50 or above. Uh, so we were at minus 50. We, were, we weren't going to get there. And so that's kind of the realization after we landed this project. 
And the scariest part, that wasn't the scariest part, the scariest part was what we had built was the train on the left. It was going to be chugging along, it was going to really kind of pro you know, produce for the business, but it would require all those people. And it, again, I don't want to be dinging Oracle so much. It wasn't Oracle's fault necessarily, it was the end-to-end -end system we had put together. But what the business needed was the train on the right. What we needed is to enable the speed of business to go fast. We're about 90% of our revenue today comes from North America. We need to move that so it's more global. Uh, about 60% about of our revenue comes from our online or service-based offerings. We need to move that to 100% over time. We have a lot of change and shifts we're driving in the business and we need to move at speed and enable our employees to move at speed and we hadn't built that. The last piece of context, then I'll dive into the story, is there really is a technology strategy add into it that we're driving, which is APIs first. Uh, and this is where it's relevant for, for you all. Is the, and there's three stories to that. One is we have a new strategy at IT now, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, to really consume services from best in class vendors. Examples like Salesforce and Zuara for billing and Oracle on demand. We're still working with Oracle, but now moving to their on demand. Workday and others, so consuming services as APIs from best-in-class vendors. The second is creating services out of our venerable offerings like QuickBooks and TurboTax to enable new offerings that either we build internally ourselves or we enable third parties to build. One example is a loan offering where now we're helping small businesses get approved for loans in days with much higher rates by pairing them up with lenders who, who, who uh, meet their needs. And we do that through exposing the QuickBooks data. Everything a lender needs to decide if a small business is worthy of a loan is in their QuickBooks file. So we expose that as APIs and, and allow lenders to pull that information out with user's permission and can make decisions within days. Uh, and that's a product that's live today. That's just one example. We're also doing with our tax product and other things. And you may have seen both unlocking our data through our small business index or our payroll index that gets uh, reported on the news now, uh, but also APIs. And then the third is starting to think of our back office as a service to really think about everything that I run in IT now as a service to the company, but also to our third party developers. Because we have people building on our Intuit partner platform offerings that hook into QuickBooks or a hook into TurboTax, and we want to allow them to do things like send out bills so that we can, they can ride on our back office. So that's kind of the whole set of, of context. So the new strategy we have for IT at Intuit is to really think of enterprise business platform, which is a set of capabilities that we're composing through best-in-class partners to make available to Intuit. And those services are everything you would imagine from pricing, promotions, order management, CRM, uh, and really go with best-in-class SaaS or vendor managed if they don't have it. So moving into Oracle's data center. We're still going to use eBiz Suite for our financials, but Oracle is now man managing that for us. And what our internal IT team doing is managing that whole set of services end to end as a unified platform that Intuit uses to run its business on. The second part of the strategy is to then create APIs for every capability in that platform. And that's why I underlined and highlighted the word all, because we really want to expose everything to our offering teams or our marketing teams who are building experiences for customers. The way it used to work is they would come to IT, we would help design the interface, we would you know, have those roomfuls of people deciding what could be done uh, from a revenue rec recognition standpoint, SOX compliance standpoint, there was all of this compliance work way up front. Instead, what we really want to do is unleash our offering teams to experiment with that user interface, the, the type of offerings they want to provide, the type of promotions they want to do, but we still need to, of course, protect core things like SOX compliance and revenue recognition, so build APIs for the capabilities on that and get out of the middle uh, so that really we can unleash the power of our marketing and development teams. And the only other thing that's really important is to allow teams to iterate. You can't always get it right, and you don't want to do this big investment up front, so you want to do great iterative development, like everyone's doing today, and you want to empower the development teams to do that. The other, and this is, this sounds nice on a slide, it's always hard to do, is, you know, someday Salesforce is not going to be the latest, greatest CRM. Something else is. Uh, there's already ones emerging that are going to uh, take the place of them. You know, Zawara isn't going to be the latest next builder. We want to be able to enable us to switch out vendors without having to then go back up into our offerings and make changes. So this API layer that we're building also isolates those from vendor changes. Not completely, obviously some of it comes through, but that's one of our objectives. Uh, and then the last thing is really to get IT out of the middle, uh, but maintain what we need to maintain. And so, oh, I'm pushing the wrong button. There we go. So this is at a very high level kind of what it looks like. In the middle here where it says business applications and services, those are our best in class 
SaaS partners that we're moving to, but we're sitting on a set of legacy offerings today, like Siebel for order management, like BRM from Oracle for billing, but we're also adding in Zawara. The other thing having this API layer lets us do is maybe have multiple providers for a service. So we can have Zawara or BRM as our billers, and we can use those for different offerings and experiment um, by having an API on top. And so we've built this interface layer, exposing a set of capabilities up into not only our customer-facing user experiences, but product uh, and agent-facing. So that's kind of our high-level architecture that we're putting in place. And some key components of this. One is to have a set of standard vendor neutral, as I talked about, so you can swap out the vendors, uh, really so that they can be consumed across multiple uh, modalities as well. So whether it's web or it's mobile or it's in, or in product, we really want to have one set of APIs that everybody can use. The other, and this is really important, is that it's self-service in a consistent way so that it basically a developer in an offering team doesn't have to talk to IT, that's the goal, to really consume these services. But that means, of course, you have to build really robust APIs that are resilient, that can throttle, et cetera. To have a standard message bus underneath so that we can do the protocol and the communications between the systems, and, la and lastly, just build general low latency, highly available, high performance. Both synchronous and asynchronous. When you're doing enterprise applications, there are times, and I know there's kind of religious wars about synchronous and asynchronous, frankly, there are times when you need to do both, and there are reasons to do both, uh, and so that's an important thing that we've decided as well. And then exposing those all through a common service fabric, and I talked about the three different API stories going on at Intuit today. You know, one is turning many of our offerings into services. We have the same fabric, the same registry, the same developer portal, whether you're accessing a service from QBO to look at loan data, or whether you're accessing a billing API from the back end. So if you're a developer at Intuit and you want to use an API, there's one place to go. There's one set of standards to learn. And we're exposing that to third parties, and we're using the same exact portal for both third parties and internal developers. So here's where we are on the journey. We released our first set of enterprise-based APIs. Uh, on the 2nd of September, so we're very new at this, but it's actually out and it's, and it's in production. Uh, and a couple things we've learned so far. Technically, this is easier than culturally, uh, which is often the case. Uh, but culturally, one of the things we've learned is, you know, prioritization is super hard. Uh, of course, all of our business units and all of our third-party developers want every API right now. They want them all stable. Prioritization is hard. The thing we've learned, and, it, and it's somewhat obvious, but it, it really the, it is important, is to really involve the consumers of the API in the prioritization and be as transparent as possible about your principles on which you're going to prioritize which set of APIs. So, what, and kind of what I'm talking about is we have a set of APIs to allow end customers to self-serve changing their billing address, to self-serve canceling a product, to add a product so they don't have to call in. We have a set of APIs to allow our offerings to send billing information and produce a bill or to communicate with customers. Which of those APIs are we going to get done first because we can't do them all at once? That's what I mean by prioritization. The other is granularity is hard. Uh, you know, it would be great if we could decompose everything completely and allow everyone to pick and choose and create these really great experiences, but the reality is we're still accountable with our finance team to be SOX compliant in how we do all of our revenue recognition, how we're managing and have auditability across. And so the, with the level of granularity, the level of exposure is actually a tricky thing to get. And it, you want to err on the side of exposing as much as possible, but remaining uh, compliant. And the last thing is you really can't control everything. Uh, and that's been a big cultural change within uh, my organization, within the IT organization, because the way IT organizations have typically worked is they control everything. Uh, and they work through a process of governance about deciding what to do. This is really about letting go. This is really about keeping the governance at the lower level underneath the API, but then allowing people to experiment. Uh, and that's hard, uh, and that's scary. Uh, and I know we're gonna make a mistake. But part of it is, you know, as leadership, we have to make sure we're giving air cover for those kinds of mistakes, and we've built the right risk mitigation in place to handle those. You have to expect that some mistake is gonna happen. The technical lessons so far are, are also important. You know, one is, uh, as I talked about earlier, because we really want these to be self-service and because they are en these are enterprise APIs, it's really important that we have the right contingencies built in at every integration point. What happens if it fails? And, do you, and you really always want to return something back, obviously, so your application can keep moving on, your consumer can keep moving on. But what does that mean from an integrity standpoint if you're processing an order? Uh, so getting those contingencies is really 
uh, an important thing to invest time in. Uh, and avoiding early integration complexity. You really want to stick at the higher simple level first before, because what happens is if somebody will come in and say, I need an API to do everything. And you want to make sure you really understand the simplest use case first, start there, and expand out. Uh, relevant system constraints underneath. This, this is important because we're building our API layer on top of Salesforce and Zawara and BRM and all these other applications, and we have to be super careful that we don't really promise something in the API that isn't there. Uh, last, in, or a couple more, event-driven, really business process-based. This means at the integration layer, at the API definition layer, have it be more about what the business process points are, not such much a technical integration, because then if something goes wrong, you're speaking to your user of the API back in a business process fashion. Uh, so that's what that point's about. Data masters, super important. It's a very typical enterprise uh, issue. It's, but you're not going to have only one system of record. So it's very important to know which is the data master, and you're going to have multiple systems of record. So for instance, we have a customer master. And Siebel and Salesforce today are two different systems of record of us for transactions with customers. But we have to reconcile that back to our customer master. Eventually, Siebel will be out of the picture. But for a while, we're going to have multiple systems of record. Uh, and then the last thing is really, we think it's important to use a single gateway for everybody, uh, for external and internal developers, so that you just have that one set of APIs to manage and everybody's using the same set of services. Uh, and I know I kind of went through that quickly, but I also wanted to leave time for questions. Uh, and I know I'm probably between you and lunch, so uh, that is our story.